Uh, welcome back. Here's our second lecture on investment. We're going to talk a little bit more about how to build a portfolio in this one and move beyond just the two kind of assets of stocks and bonds. So let's begin with just kind of a summary of what we're going to be doing here. We're going to talk about what is an investment portfolio to start with. Secondly, we're going to how to optimize and diversify a portfolio. Diversify means how do you put a lot of different types of assets into, into the portfolio and how do you and optimize is like what do you want to include to maximize your return on your investments? So you're not just saying like, am I going to do well on this particular pick or the stock or bond or commodity purchase, but how do you make the portfolio overall perform well over a long period of time? And then lastly, we're going to go at does the capital structure, meaning how does a company finance its purchase of assets matter? Um, all these things are based upon the work of a variety of different economists, uh, Harry Markowitz, William Sharp, um, uh, Mudiani and Miller, um, all who won Nobel Prizes in economics for their work on portfolio theory and also for on investment. So let's begin talking about what a portfolio is. Um, when you choose to invest, it's not an either or uh, proposition. Uh, most people have a mix of assets assembled in a portfolio. Um, generally, when they talk about these different types of assets, they're divided into five major categories, although you can subdivide these categories into even smaller groups, depending on what, um, depending on how granular you want to get with that. So the five uh, types of asset classes. The first one is cash or cash equivalents, meaning things that are, we would generally think of as money. Um, this involves things like checking accounts and money market accounts, as well as cash in a in a bank deposit. Secondly, what we talked about in the last lecture, uh, equity or stocks. Number three, we also again talked in the last lecture, fixed income or bonds. Uh, two more, uh, real estate, meaning purchases of land. And lastly, commodities, things such as gold, oil, and other types of, let's say, um, you know, buying the actual stuff that might be used in production or things that are intrinsically valuable. So if you look at here at the bottom, you can look at some of the different types of things that kind of go under these uh, large headings. So if you look at the type of asset classes on the lower left, uh, you can see that, you know, the things about cash is that things that um, are basically liquid, meaning that it's able to use for purchases almost instantaneously. Um, it, it has the power to buy anything. The idea that why cash is valuable is that you don't necessarily need someone who wants what you're selling. They'll take cash and use that um, as a medium of exchange. Um, equity means you have ownership in a business. So you can do this in terms of buying stocks, but there's various different stocks. You could invest in large companies or small companies, domestic versus foreign companies. You can buy individual companies or you can buy a variety of different types of funds that uh, purchase stock and you buy shares into the fund. So these can be mutual funds, meaning uh, a fund that has a particular, uh, you know, theory or a strategy approach to the market. You can invest in things like index funds that buy the, an entire index, such as the Dow Jones or the S&P 500. Um, there are electronically traded funds, which basically buy uh, a basket of different uh, companies um, and you can pr go uh, purchase in and out of them. And so there's a lot of different types of ways to get involved in um, equity. I mean, and on top of everything else, you don't have to buy it on an exchange. Um, you could buy ownership in your own co a, a small company or let's say invest in a small company, um, maybe, or a partnership. Uh, fixed income um, involve things like uh, long-term cash deposits, uh, buying corporate or government bonds, such as municipal bonds or treasuries, um, a variety of different post office products, meaning the post office has things like stamps and um, uh, long-term savings, things of that sort. Um, fourth, uh, real estate, we have what are called REITs or real estate investment trusts, which allow you to buy a diverse amount of property. So instead of investing in a particular property like uh, the house that you live in or commercial property where your business uh, um, is located or a particular piece of land, a real estate investment trust allows you to buy a variety of different properties um, held as a fund and then you buy shares into that, that investment trust. Um, and lastly, you have commodities, and these are a variety of everything from agricultural products to products of mining um, to things like precious metals such as uh, silver and gold and platinum. Um, what they often vary on is um, how much risk is involved with them. And the reason why you want to ha look at these different asset classes is because some of them are very risky, and you see on the lower right, um, a lot of equity investments tend to be higher on the risk, uh, um, higher on the risk, and fixed income tends to be lower on the risk. The things that are in green and commodities, because they hold intrinsic value, are sometimes um, you know, the least risky or uh, the only risk you have is maybe um, 
I mean, particularly even a risk against inflation. Um, and real estate is usually something in between. So let's talk about diversification. So the reason why you build a portfolio is because you can hold a variety of different um, uh, different types of assets that behave differently. And so while some might be bad in one environment, other assets you might be holding will be better. Um, so for example, uh, we talked about um, uh, last time about you know uh, the 90% chance to win $10 or 10% chance to win $90 and how that might change given economic circumstances. Um, if you're only betting on one coin flip, um, like you know, 50-50 chance, such as buying or selling one particular stock or buying or selling one particular bond, um, you know, the price that's being sold at, half the people think it's going up and half think it's going down. But if you bet on multiple coin flips, like 10 or 15 or 30 coin flips, the chances that on average that will balance out, the 50-50 chance of a coin flip um, will balance itself out. So the times you win will balance out statistically by the times you lose. Um, a lot of this is also because different assets uh, do better or worse in different situations. When the economy is going up, certain things are going to do much better. Um, when the economy is sinking, other things are going to do better. People tend to buy more staples things. Just think of all the things that people bought um, recently in response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So things like toilet paper or certain types of food products or uh, you know uh, disinfectants and things of that sort. So if you were investing in one of those companies, you probably did better because there was, um, you could say, an unexpected demand for the products. Um, even when things are doing poorly, people tend to focus on their core things, the things they absolutely need. Um, what you're seeing doing very poorly are things that are like you might call discretionary. So uh, restaurants, uh, entertainment, tourism, uh, leisure activities are, are getting beaten down. And generally, the same thing happens when the economy declines is that people will vacation less, they won't go to amusement parks, they won't gamble as much, um, and they'll look for types of entertainments that are going to be cheaply or locally provided. Um, the last thing is that different assets have different levels of liquidity, which means your ability to turn them into money or to turn them into exchange them in for other assets uh, varies. Uh, so a bond might have a very long term uh, horizon. Um, you might have trouble selling it, especially if it's a, you know, it might be really hard to sell a particular property or house or commercial uh, mall or things of that sort. But if you have an investment trust that is diversified, um, even though there might be some poorly performing properties in there, People might buy a share or sell a share in the investment trust because they're not like hooked into a particular situation or a particular geographical location. So the most liquid asset tends to be tend to be commodities and cash and currencies uh, because they're taken as mediums of exchange. Um, and what might happen is kind of happened in 2008 in the financial crisis is that there might be a lot of sellers and not enough buyers to buy what people want to sell. Um, and the market will not, won't be deep enough or, or liquid enough to, uh, to absorb, let's say, the type of activity that people um, want. And you also see this in the movie The Big Short, where when people wanted to bet against the real estate market in 2005 and 2006, what they did is they went to a particular investment bank uh, to create a fund that would like take the other side of the bet. So they basically had to, in a sense, create their buyer um, because they want uh, to create the, the seller to their buyer and, and buyer to their seller. Um, what you see here on the bottom is just kind of some of the correlations, which means um, what things tend to go up and down together. Obviously, everything is uh, correlated with itself. Um, but the point is that when you want to diversify, you want things that are not correlated with each other. So the point is, is that when one of them moves, um, the other one doesn't. Um, because if they all move together in one direction, or all move up or down in the same direction, um, basically, it's like buying what, the same asset and just a lot of it, even though they might have different names. So, for example, if uh, the S&P 500, which is uh, 500 large firms, uh, has a kind of a high correlation with a variety of different other stocks, um, you might as well just buy one of them, not both, because they're moving up and down together. So what you see, for example, with the S&P 500, uh, global bonds are, have a very low correlation, uh, 0.2 down to 0 0, uh, 0, uh, 0.02 and 3, um, and which means they're not really moving in the same direction. And that will give you some more diversity or more balance or hedging your bets when things are happen. Um, and lastly, on the lower right hand side, what you see is um, kind of a variety of different assets range from, you know, their level of return with their level of risk. And what you basically have is a direct relationship, which means the higher the return usually means the higher the risk. OK, so let's look at some of the different asset classes. So the first one is stocks, and I'm not going to talk too much about this because we talked about this before. 
Generally, stocks tend to be high return and high risk. Um, obviously, this depends on what stocks you're buying. Not every, every stock is ownership of a particular company. Some companies are relatively stable. Um, large companies that are usually represented in the Dow Jones, uh, smaller companies or growth companies tend to be a lot more volatile, uh, especially like new technology companies or medical research or pharmaceuticals. Um, you might see a large amount of growth, but the point is, is that if their medicine does not get approved or it fails or they're likely to be sued or shut down, um, you might not want to invest in it as it doesn't perform the same way. So several different ways of thinking about different groups of stocks. You can think about large companies, usually the 30 companies listed in the Dow Jones, the 30 largest industrial companies in the country, versus small co uh, companies which are listed on the Russell 2000, which is 2000 kind of like mid-level or mid-sized businesses. Uh, mid-sized businesses are going to face a lot more competition. They're not going to be able to dominate their market. At the same time, there might be more growth, which means they might be more responsive to the ups and downs of the economy, so that the companies listed in the Dow Jones are going to be kind of like moving big tankers or battleships. Um, you know, companies in the Russell 2000 are going to be a lot more nimble, which means they're going to be a lot more sensitive, both up and down with the movements of the economy. Uh, you can trade in tech companies, and generally the NASDAQ is involved in, you might say, uh, new technologies. Uh, it used to be very much into electronics and electronic uh, things like Apple or um, uh, Apple is no longer really a, a, a new company, but companies that are kind of, let's say, have a high growth or are based upon innovation and new products uh, versus staple products, things like Procter & Gamble, which makes things like shaving cream and uh, toilet paper and things that people buy, uh, toothbrush and toothpaste, um, toothbrushes and toothpaste. And so something like that is going to be a lot more stable. The demand for um, staples are not going to really grow that much, but there's a kind of a steady demand for them, regardless of what's happening in the ups and downs of the economy. Uh, you can do foreign versus domestic. So, for example, if you think a particular country is going to do well, you might want to buy into that exchange, even though you don't know what companies are there. Um, or if you, uh, or for example, you might make a reaction to what their um, central bank is doing, whether they're raising or lowering interest rates. Um, so you might want to buy more or less into particular markets. Uh, Nikkei is a uh, stock market for Japan versus the New York NYSC, stands for New York Stock Exchange might be a domestic exchange. So you might have funds, let's say, in different markets that are trading in businesses in general in different countries and different economies. Um, you can have high growth countries. Generally, they're called emerging markets because small companies have a lot more growth ahead of them, um, which means they have a, a high ceiling to fill out. Um, they're going to grow faster generally, and they're going to grow more. Um, they are going to be more risky because they're not as established, um, but you might want to expose yourself to the high growth potential in these emerging markets versus um, investing in established economies such as Western Europe, uh, Japan, the United States. Um, so stocks are inherently volatile. They move around every day. Just in the past two weeks, we've seen stocks go up and down 10% um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that's a lot of volatility because nothing, you know, obviously there are fears out there, but nothing changes about the underlying value of the company or the stock in a single day. Um, but the key thing about stocks is even though they're inherently volatile and there is a lot of risk associated with them, uh, generally people ha do not invest what they should, which means given to what the return is, um, assuming a rational investor, people do not invest in stocks as much as they should. And as a result, there's kind of, let's say, a return premium that uh, you actually get a larger return on stocks than you would j based on just like growth in the economy and growth in, let's say, profits. Um, because most people are hesitant to invest in the stock market relative to other types of investments. So ROI, and you're going to see this a lot, it means just return on investment. Uh, from 1926 to 2018, generally you've seen a 10% increase in stocks. That means overall for the entire stock market. That doesn't mean it hasn't gone up and down, but over time, that's a 10% return. And that's a relatively good return on, on an investment. So that turns us to our second asset class, which are bonds. Um, generally, these are also sometimes referred to as fixed income because the return, a bond has a certain value. So on, the, on each bond is a par value or face value. Um, when that bond gets redeemed, generally that's the amount you're, going, you're expecting to receive, especially if it's the uh, reputable issuer of the bond. Um, and therefore the income is fixed. So while stocks can go up much more than let's say the face value of the, or purchase price of the stock, uh, bonds kind of have a ceiling on them. So bonds are generally thought of as lower, lower return. I mean, they're not always low. You could have, invest in junk bonds that are more speculative and get a higher yield or higher return on them. 
but generally people like them because they have lower risk involved and lower volatility. Um, so bonds can be government bonds, such as uh, U.S. Treasury bonds, but also municipal bonds uh, that finance like purchase and infrastructure and things of that sort. I just a little interruption, so I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, so some differences in types of bonds can be government bonds or public bonds, such as uh, U.S. Treasury, um, and also municipal bonds for things like cities or towns or school districts, versus uh, private bonds that are issued by uh, corporations as a way of like raising money, but generally these are going to be relatively large corporations like GE, IBM, Apple, etc. Um, and, uh, you know, generally they're going to be relatively you know, a high rating. Um, you can buy bonds that are, one downside to bonds is that um, inflation, meaning um, the decreasing value of money, because you have a nominal face value on the bond, if there's uh, high inflation, that bond is going to uh, lose its value very quickly. So you can buy some bonds with uh, inflation protection, which means um, their value is, uh, you know, anchored or tied or indexed to the inflation rate, um, and therefore the time to maturity um, can um, differ. And you can also then the distinction between foreign and domestic bonds. So foreign bonds, um, you might not have as many rights on; it might be harder to collect, um, especially if it's a country that is not friendly uh, to the United States or does not have the same legal protections that generally. Uh, American law has for um, bondholders um, or domestic bonds once within the United States. So generally bonds are pretty stable as investments, at least in a developed economy, um, and they're relatively liquid. And if you think that cash is just a short-term bond, um, you can think of, let's say, a continuum between cash and cash equivalents and bonds. And, you, and the difference is the time horizon on them. And generally bonds like uh, issued by the United States federal government are going to be very liquid. Um, and be treated as money um, in most places and for most transactions around the world. Um, however, you can have speculative junk bonds that are really low rated bonds. And because uh, no one expects them to pay off, you can purchase them for literally pennies on the dollar. And so if they do actually, or if they are actually are honored when they mature, um, you can make a huge uh, uh, yield or a huge uh, return on your investment on them. Um, but they're, you know, speculative, meaning they're, they behave more like stocks than they do like other types of bonds. And the other thing that happens with bond markets is they can kind of freeze, which means uh, people, if generally people want to sell bonds when something adversely happens to the company or the government issuing the bond, like it loses a war or, you know, um, it has uh, some type of crisis or uh, violence or things of that sort, natural disaster, or something happens to the corporation, like you find out that um, they don't have as much money. Um, no one, no one, you might not be able to sell out of them because no one wants to buy a bond that is quickly losing its value. And as a result, you can kind of get trapped into the bond. That's sort of what happened with mortgage-backed mortgage -backed securities um, in the 2007, 2008, um, is that people wanted to unload these mortgage-backed securities and there really were really many buyers at that point. Uh, bonds, um, not surprisingly, have a lower rate of return. So over the same period we talked about stocks from 1926 to uh, 2018, they have about a 5% return on the investment. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about cash and currency. And cash is basically the most liquid, meaning uh, it can be used for any transactions. And you generally wanna have some cash in a portfolio because that cash can be used to buy, um, you know, opportunistically things that are undervalued. So for example, if you see the stock market go down 10% and you wanna buy on the dip, having cash on hand um, and not having to liquidate other types of, uh, or not, if you don't think you have time to wait, um, meaning that uh, you don't have time to liquidate other types of assets to be able to purchase um, stocks, bonds, commodities, real estates, et cetera, um, cash can always be taken and acted on immediately. Um, generally, there is no return other than maybe the interest rate on your uh, cash uh, balances um, and generally no risk. And I have asterisks here because there is a return and there is some risk. Um, generally, we'll talk, Cash has an inflation risk because cash has a face value on it. If there is high levels of inflation, um, cash can lose its value um, relative to uh, you know uh, goods and services and commodities and other things. So there is cash, meaning like the green pieces of paper and the coins that we use, and there's something also called cash equivalents, which means any type of security that can be turned into money and within uh, 60 to 90 days is generally treated as the same as cash, and so this means uh, checking accounts, uh, money market funds, uh, high-grade commercial paper, as well as cash and coins. Uh, so I mentioned before about the inflation risk. Um, 
there's always a risk. Uh, one cash can be treated like a commodity, except that there is, uh, you know, it loses its value in an inflationary environment, in which way commodities wouldn't. Um, if you are buying foreign currencies, uh, there's an exchange rate risk, which means if something happens, meaning that the central bank in Japan or the central bank in China or the uh, central bank um, in the eurozone um, decides to change its interest rate, um, the, uh, the relative values of different currencies can change. Uh, so for example, if you're an American investor buying yen, yuan, or euros, and let's say an event happens in one part of the world, but not another, um, this could either be a risk up or a risk down as far as uh, the investment losing its value. Um, and the return is based on the interest rate. And if you're talking about American currency, uh, generally this is the same as a risk-free return on capital for cash balances. Um, the reason why you have in the portfolio is not an idea that it's going to make money, is that it gives you liquidity and gives you flexibility to shift into and out of various different asset um, class positions. Um, this means it can cover you know, leverage purchases, which means if you have a margin call on a stock purchase that is leveraged, which means you borrow to make the purchase. Um, having a cash balance can give you a buffer against the ups and downs in a more volatile asset class. And as I said before, it allows you to quickly buy distressed assets. Okay, our fourth asset class that we're gonna talk about is real estate. Um, and I think particularly one is something called the Real Estate Investment Trust. Um, this allows you, instead of buying, let's say, a property in full, um, you can have a trust, which means it's a fund that buys a variety of different properties. So it might buy things like uh, apartment buildings or hotels or commercial real estate or malls. And what you don't, you don't actually own the building itself, but you do have a share in a fund. So you can buy, let's say, 10 shares of um, a real estate investment trust, and this trust then goes out and buys a variety. It's managed by a fund manager who then, let's say, does the legwork for you, investigates high return properties such as uh, hotels or apartment buildings or malls or commercial space. Um, and one nice thing about it is that it was created in the 1950s and it's required by law to pay out its income as dividends, which means um, you, it's good for, you know, providing kind of a steady income and generally as real estate grows, you get like some income off this guaranteed, similar to having a, a dividend, um, for a high, highly rated stock that has a, a dividend policy. Um, the other thing about it is that in, when you buy one, uh, real, uh, real estate, like you buy one mall or one house or one uh, commercial building, um, it could be in the worst place. Like, uh, you think of a restaurant that has a really bad location problem. It's located in a place where no one wants to do business um, and you can lose all your money in that type of investment. Um, in a REIT, you can buy a variety of different, uh, let's say, properties. Um, and while some of them might not do well, probably some other ones will, and you can buy different kinds of properties, commercial versus residential. So the idea you can have a mix of apartment buildings with hotels, with commercial um, real estate. And as a result, um, there can be, let's say, a diversification inherent in buying a, uh, a REIT like that. So different types of real estate, commercial, meaning um, business real estate, such as storefronts versus residential real estate. Uh, one thing that happened after the 2008 when many people were losing their houses is that there were a variety of different people who were buying up houses and basically converting them into rental units. Um, and so they had these large funds figuring that as people lost their houses, they're probably gonna become more likely to be renters um, and therefore there would be a good market for rental properties. Um, so there is some volatility in real estate as recent, let's say the two decades of the housing bubble kind of indicate, and there tends to be more bubbles in certain areas, uh, particularly when there's a lack of zoning, um, meaning places like uh, Florida, uh, Southern California, Las Vegas, uh, places that have more zoning or more restrictions such as uh, Texas after the late 1980s when they had their own bubble, they passed some laws that, um, don't allow for as much uh, sprawl as you would have in other places. Um, and Westchester would be another good example where um, it's hard to, let's say, uh, build a lot more housing units because Westchester already is pretty much full and there's pretty much constant demand uh, through the business cycle for real estate in this area. Uh, so real estate does seem to average about the same return on investment, about 10%, a little bit less than you would if you were making equity investment. Now, for obvious reasons, um, this varies by geography. Um, as the saying goes, location, location, location. Um, a lot of real estate investments just come from knowing what's going to happen in a particular place. Like if you know that there's going to be um, infrastructure or a road, or there's going to be uh, a business moving into town, creating jobs, 
um, that piece of land could be worth a lot more than its intrinsic value. Um, and the other reason why people like real estate is that, and I put an asterisk here because while there's only so much land in the, on the world and there's a growing volume of people and demand for uh, uh, land, um, there's not a scarcity of land in the sense there's scarcity of different kinds of land, which means uh, there's, there's land. There's a lot of land in Antarctica. There's a lot of land in Upper Canada. Um, it's just not necessarily usable. Um, and then you have places where there's, let's say, um, a definite scarcity uh, like Lower Manhattan real estate. Um, one other thing about it is that it's diversified because it's one of the asset classes that has really little correlation with bonds. And as a result, people like to use it as kind of a, a hedge against the movement in the bond market. So if they have a lot of bonds, uh, real estate is an uncorrelated type of investment class, at least in general. Um, it change, obviously, these correlations can change over time, but does not seem to be varying in the same way or have the same pattern. And as a result, it helps diversify your overall portfolio. So our last asset class we're going to talk about is commodities. Um, people like the commodities because they have intrinsic value. If you buy copper, people need copper for real things like copper wiring, uh, electronics, etc. Um, and therefore, there's going to be some intrin uh, inherent demand for the for what you're buying. Um, so that's the one thing is that people like commodities. The other thing is that commodities generally don't have inflation risk, and I'll get back to that in a second. Um, the other thing about certain types of commodities, particularly precious metals, is that there's a lot of liquidity because people are always buying and selling them, and because uh, there's this belief that precious metals have intrinsic value that anyone will take gold, silver, and platinum uh, for payment. Um, people like to have a little bit of this and they like it uh, for a different type of liquidity relative to cash because um, commodities have intrinsic value and they don't have the nominal face value that, uh, that let's say currencies have. And as a result, if you're worried about inflation, you might want to have some type of uh, position in these precious metals. Um, there's, often you see people like trying to say gold is the solution to everything and because of some, uh, I would say, generally paranoid theory about governments and central banks think that gold is the only and best investment. Um, this is kind of the same thing of people who invest in things like Bitcoin. Um, while you might be able to make money by investing in these, um, if you don't have specialized knowledge and um, there's a lot more volatility here um, than you see maybe in a lot of other investments. So gold has gone up a lot in price and gold has also crashed quite often. And that's been the pattern since um, Nixon went off the gold standard uh, for the US dollar back in the early 1970s. Um, so the other thing about buying commodities is that, let's say that I want to, I know that a certain type of industry is going to do well, um, but I don't know which companies are going to be the ones who rise to the top because it's relatively undefined. Um, like for example, I, I think that uh, um, lithium batteries are going to become um, really important for uh, cell phones and smartphones and tablets. Um, but I don't know who's going to be the big tablet maker or phone to dominate the market in uh, phones. So I don't want to invest in Samsung or Apple. What I can invest, invest in is something that I know they're going to need, like lithium, um, to make their batteries. Or I know they're going to need some type of rare earth metals and things of that sort. So that I, I know that my commodity will increase in value because there's a, a new demand for it by the growth of a particular industry that I'm pretty sure will do well without having to like put all my eggs in one basket and pick which firm I think is going to come out ahead on this. Um, so I kind of referred to this before, it's an inflation hedge because commodities keep their value because they're not denominated in terms of currency like securities and bonds are. And if you're worried about inflation, um, you know, it gives you kind of a, a hedge against the risk of inflation, which many other things in your portfolio might not have. Um, obviously, it depends on the commodities. It's going to be very volatile. Some commodities go up and down quite significantly in short periods of time. Uh, most recently, like oil has had kind of that, that uh, volatility to it. Um, the other thing is, just like I was saying before, there's a scarcity value, just like real estate. There's only so much of the precious metals, um, agricultural commodities and things of that sort. And so um, an asset that has some type of scarcity means that uh, the scarcity will give it, will keep the price or the value of the asset relatively high. Um, and the last thing is commodities provide diversification in the overall portfolio because they're not necessarily highly correlated with uh, the values of stocks and bonds. And as a result, you can use commodities as a hedge uh, for the movements in those other asset classes. So that's kind of a review of the most uh, five basic asset classes people generally hold.
So let's go back to something that I mentioned in the last lecture, which is kind of this idea of optimism versus pessimism or risk versus return. So just to take the two uh, ones we talked about extensively in the previous lecture, uh, stocks are kind of, let's say, a high, a high risk, high return type of investment, a 10% chance to win $90. Uh, bonds are a low risk, low return type of investment, a 90% chance to win $10. Um, and you can think of all different types of, let's say, assets of having, you know, different combinations of risk and return. Um, they don't just have to be high risk, high return, and low risk, low return, although that's generally the pattern. Um, and the reason is something that will go next is like uh, Markowitz's efficient frontier. Um, and without going through the full details of what Markowitz did and just kind of showing to this gra graphically to you, is that Mark Witt said, look, there's a, some basic assumptions. If you have two assets in your portfolio and they have exactly the same return, you're going to choose the one that has less risk, right? So if the return on two assets is both $90 and one is a 10% risk and one is a 15% risk, you're going to choose a 15% risk, meaning the 15% chance of getting that uh, return. So the point is that if you can keep returns constant, you're going to look for the less risky uh, asset to hold. Now, if uh, conversely, or uh, a second assumption, it's not really conversely, um, if two assets have the same level of risk, if there's two uh, assets and there's a 10% chance of, of that both of them hitting um, and providing a return, you're going to have the one with the greater return. So if two assets have a 10% risk and one has a $90 return and one has a $100 return, you'd rather have the $100 return. And from those assumptions, um, what you can basically do is create a, a frontier, and this is what you see in the lower left-hand side, this hyperbola here, the blue line. Um, and what it's showing you is a combination of, let's say, returns, meaning uh, what you expect of the return on investment, and then on the x-axis, volatility, which is just the variability. It's another way of thinking about uh, the probability of, of the return happening for a basically an, uh, a frontier of a fully 100% stock portfolio versus 100% bond portfolio. And for things I'm not going to get into, it takes this hyperbola shape. Um, everything to the right of the curve is basically uh, less than efficient. Um, uh, like, for example, uh, there's a more efficient allocation between stocks and bonds. So if you've taken economics and you've seen the production possibilities frontier, uh, this is kind of more or less the same idea. Everything uh, below the line is something that you wouldn't choose to do because it's a, le a less efficient allocation of resources so that we think that the best um, allocation of resources is going to be something along the frontier. And the frontier can move for a variety of different reasons. Um, and so we can think of different curves and you see the difference between the blue line and the gray line as the benefit that comes from diversification, which means the, the benefit that comes from having, let's say, uh, various different assets in your portfolio. Um, the leverage benefit comp, it basically is saying, what is the benefit that happens when you borrow money to, to like you borrow money from, let's say, uh, a less performing, uh, you borrow money, maybe, for example, you borrow money at a risk-free rate of return of the interest rate, and you buy an asset that's going to have a higher return. So let's say you borrow money at 3% interest, and you purchase an asset that returns 7, 8, 10%. Okay, so the leverage benefit is what you would get if you could, let's say, borrow money and then buy a, a, higher, a higher return on investment, uh, an asset with a higher return on investment. So what you can see is this kind of orange dotted line, and uh, it starts, its intercept is at the risk-free rate, which is generally the interest rate on cash balances, and that you, it has one tangent point as a tangent line with the, uh, the efficient, uh, efficient frontier of your portfolio. And generally, that's where you would think is like that's the best portfolio of a combination of risk or return um, should be, because that's where you wouldn't have to borrow any money. Let's say if you have $100, how should you divide that $100 between stocks and bonds or other um, asset classes in your portfolio? Now, you can always, by levering up, which means by borrowing money to buy more assets, perhaps get a higher rate of return which means if you go, let's say, along the orange dotted line from the blue star to the orange star, um, you might be able to get a higher return, but then you would have more risk, and the greater risk is coming with the fact that you borrow that money and you're going to be a little bit levered. Uh, and lever just means, let's say, uh, you bought um, uh, on the margin. Um, and if you're pretty certain that you're, if you're confident that your risk is uh, worth it, 
then you might uh, you might borrow the money to get a higher rate of return. Um, and that's basically what Markowitz was saying. And on the lower right, you see kind of um, a hypothesized. Now, this is uh, obviously showing a perfect direct relationship, but I think it might just uh, uh, pause here because what you see in the lower left-hand corner are the lowest returns, lowest risk types of assets. And what you see in the upper right-hand corner are the high risk, high return assets. And kind of just showing them from one as they progress up. Um, now, this is not the actual relationship between these. It's not that perfect um, of, a, of, a, uh, of a regression line. Um, but it kind of gives you a way of, let's say, um, abstractly sorting out what is the relative risk and returns for different assets and asset classes and subdivisions within those asset classes. So this brings us to another thing called the Sharpe Ratio, which is how do you measure the risk of an individual asset? So uh, Markowitz is mostly talking about the, uh, the efficient frontier for an allocation in a portfolio of a given size. But the point is, let's say I want to add an asset uh, to that portfolio is it is going to be good and um, the problem is the, how do you know what the risk is for a particular asset as opposed to the entirety of the portfolio um, and Sharp William Sharp who won the Nobel Prize for some advances in portfolio theory um, basically uh, parceled risk into two categories one is systematic risk which means there are factors that affect all the value of all assets Right when the economy grows, it doesn't just help one particular stock; it generally helps all the stocks. Um, and this is, let's say, the overall performance of the stock market. So not IBM, but maybe the Dow Jones. Um, I'm not even sure if uh, uh, IBM is in the Dow Jones, but let's say uh, I believe um, United Technologies is. Um, so that the Dow Jones overall might be the systematic risk. What that means: the movement of the overall index, the Dow Jones, the S&P 500, the Russell 2000, etc. Um, and it's called beta, beta being the slope, is this kind of, you could say, this, the overall performance of the index. Um, and this is more or less the same thing as the tangent, uh, the slope of the tangent to the Markowitz frontier, or the dotted orange line we saw in the previous slide. Um, and then you have a different thing, which is the asset risk, which means how does this asset perform to its overall index? So um, United Technologies might do better or worse than the Jones as a whole. And so the point is, if it has a high alpha, um, that is, let's say, a greater return um, on that particular asset relative to the overall, let's say, risk-free rate of return. Um, the risk is the variance of the asset value. So how much does the return on investment uh, move around? Um, so what sharp, the sharp ratio basically, uh, want, if it's above one, it's a good investment. If it's below one, it's maybe not a good investment. And you take the risk, uh, for, uh, you minus the risk-free rate of return, you subtract that out of the overall return rate. And basically you're just comparing things to the overall, let's say, the systematic risk of the overall index. So the point is risks are relative to some type of anchor, which is a risk-free rate of return. Um, and then you divide that by the uh, volatility um, and you basically take a standard deviation is how many standard deviations of the, over, of the stock or the portfolio that you're purchasing. Now, um, this is a good way of doing this, but it also has an implication that perhaps the best way of getting the risk-free rate of return is just by buying an index of the overall stock market. So instead of buying individual companies and stocks, what you might want to do is just buy the overall stock market because all the, if you take the beta, that's the average or the, the, line, the best fit line. And so the point is that some are going to have alphas above that line, but there's going to be other stocks that have alphas below the line. And if you buy all of them, well, it's going to average out to that beta slope, um, the relatively risk-free rate of return. So the best way to diversify your portfolio is just not to buy individual stocks and do all the homework and all, all the work that requires understanding whether the stocks are going to perform better, but just buying the, the stock market as a whole. And as the overall stock market goes up, you do well. Um, because at any given time, the stock market is never, everything in the stock market is not going to crash at the same time. Um, meaning that uh, while some types of stocks are going to do better, some types of companies will do better, um, other companies are going to do worse and vice versa. And the way to hedge against those risks and diversify your portfolio is by owning all of them. And an index fund, um, uh, you really pioneered by something John Bogle, um, is one way of doing that, which means they buy all the different stocks and they weight them in the stock market, whether it's the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, Dow Jones, etc. Um, and you can buy shares in that fund that buys the overall stock market. And that's a way of, you know, uh, de, uh, de facto diversifying your risks. 
Uh, now, the idea is that, well, beta is nice, but everyone thinks they can do a little bit better than the market. Um, and so people are always trying to find the alpha or seeking alpha, meaning those types of stocks that are going to perform better than the overall index. Okay, lastly, we're going to talk about uh, ca uh, the capital structure, which is, it's called Modigliani Miller, which are the two economists that devise this. They both won Nobel Prizes for this work. And I apologize for the graph, which is in French. And so before I explain this, let me just kind of uh, translate from French for you on the graph. On the vertical axis, it says the, uh, the rate of return. And on the, uh, the horizontal axis, it basically says the debt equity ratio, which means how much debt for every share of equity. Um, and going from zero to uh, debt is, uh, you have as much debt as you have equity. Um, now, the, the, uh, there's three lines on it, a blue one, a red one, and a black one. The black one is the weighted average cost of capital, which means what is the cost of uh, uh, financing one additional unit of capital. Um, the blue line shows you the expected return for uh, stockholders. Um, the red one shows you the expected return for creditors or bondholders. Um, and what you see here is that basically the black line, the weighted average cost of capital, is constant. It's basically a horizontal line uh, parallel to the x-axis, which indicates that even as, let's say, the cost of uh, financing through debt or equity change, the weighted average cost of capital, it's constant, meaning that it doesn't actually matter how you finance. Um, firms own assets, equipment, buildings, vehicles, etc., cetera, um, and they can find this through equity, which means by issuing stock and having people make contributions um, in exchange for ownership, or they can finance through debt, uh, by issuing bonds. Um, and what Modigliani and Miller basically found is that if you can, with certain ex uh, assumptions, which means if you live in a world of efficient markets and there's no taxes um, on uh, different types of financing, then you shouldn't care about how you are financing, whether you have more debt or more equity, it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you have more stock, there's going to be a lower return uh, per share or lower earnings per share. So the, basically that takes care of itself. And if you have more debt, what you're going to do is pay a higher interest rate as you borrow more. Um, because people will stuck in worry that you're borrowing so much that you won't be able to pay back their previous creditors. And so they might charge a higher rate of interest to extend more credit to you. Um, there's no change. Now, the key thing here is that this doesn't describe the actual world. Um, because the assumptions of this model that there is no taxation and that we have perfectly efficient markets is not true. Um, and people might not respond rationally. And the key thing here for the American uh, situation uh, uh, environment is that we tax uh, debt very differently than we tax equity. Um, and the way that standard accounting rules work is that the, your interest expense, the interest you pay on borrowed money, um, is subtracted as an expense and therefore reduces, let's say, your profit. So you have your revenues and you subtract from your revenues your expenses. And one of those expenses is the interest you pay on borrowed money. This is going to lead to a lower profit. The more you borrow, the more interest you're going to have, the lower your profit's going to be, and therefore the lower your tax liability. Um, while dividends are determined after uh, profits are determined, um, they're not treated as an expense. And as a result, what happens with that is that um, you know uh, your taxes are going to be um, your taxes are going to be higher um, if you finance more through equity. Um, because it's not subtracted and therefore you're gonna uh, you're gonna have, seem to have a larger profit and that might mean your dividend is larger uh, but you're going to pay more taxes on the corporate uh, on the corporate income uh, let me just restate that because I think that I might have been confused and I might have what I what's in my head and what I said might be different is basically that because uh, dividends are determined post determination of profits in accounting meaning that uh, it's not subtracted as an expense um, your profits are going to be higher and therefore your taxes are going to be higher. As a result, what happens for most Ameri uh, large firms is that they tend to be levered up, which means they tend to borrow more than uh, similarly situated firms in other countries um, and, or with different accounting rules. And as a result, this leads to a little more instability for the overall system because you have a lot of businesses that have a lot, are carrying a lot of debt. Um, probably the best example of this is our current president as a businessman where he used to say, I'm like the king of debt. And what he meant by that is that he financed a lot by borrowing. Um, and because uh, he, he would declare bankruptcy, but also that you saw a lot of, let's say, um, volatility in his investments in real estate, uh, casinos, and gaming over uh, his business career. 
Um, but the point is that he was it's kind of in some ways a rational react a rational way to react uh, when the tax laws make it easier or more efficient to borrow the money rather than finance it through uh, uh, um, through uh, issuing stock. Okay, and that's where we end for today, and that's our last slide. Um, I'll see you next time. We're going to shift to a new topic. We're going to look a little bit about survey research and about consumer behavior. And I look forward to uh, continuing the discussion with you. So have a good day and bye for now.